Hi everybody, welcome to 360 Culture with Premier Teaching and Learning. Today I'm here with Kelly Minks. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem. I, you know, I love Kelly. Kelly has been just a great ear, just a wonderful person just to bounce ideas off of. She's pretty amazing, let me just tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so she founded Bilingual Bridges, which is amazing. And she's an Alaskan bilingual. In 2017, uh, Kelly, Br Kelly Minks, let me start that again. Sorry about that. Bilingual Bridges was founded in 2017 by an Alaskan bilingual teacher, Kelly Minks, on the line right now. She has 12 years of experience in teaching English as a second language, Spanish, literacy, you know, accent training, which, you know, it's kind of like a rare form and we definitely need teachers like that in the school system, especially now. With bilingual classes and students, she teaches of all ages. Her passion is for language, culture, social welfare, education, which kind of has led her to live and volunteer in Argentina, South Korea, Vietnam, Chile, Peru, uh, Costa Rica, and India. Oh my goodness, love Indian food, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> and I've been in India, so the Indian food is totally different, but <laughs> well-traveled, well-experienced. And so she holds a master's degree in bilingual education reform from DePaul University, a uh, U.S. Uh, teaching license, and a CELTA teaching certificate. That's <laughs> amazing. Like I said, I'm bringing to you some exceptional people, and Kelly is one of them. In addition to teaching as a second, English as a second language and dual language programs in diverse and urban and settings. So from Chicago to Indianapolis, Kelly Minks is your person. So thank you again for coming, Kelly. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be a part of this. <laughs> she is here to give us some good information on promoting bilingualism and academic achievement among English learners. So take it away, Kelly. Thank you. So yeah, like Cassandra said, um, we're focusing on uh, promoting bilingualism and academic achievement among English learners in schools, um, especially right now with everything moving online, there is a huge focus not only to meet the needs of all of our learners, um, but really trying to figure out how we're going to serve our English learners. Um, so I have some best practice tips for K-12 instructional leaders. So first, identifying who are English learners. Um, they're students with limited English proficiency. They are expected to master academic content at the same time that they're needing to learn English. Many of them are beginning school in the United States. The schools are monolingual English uh, schools. A lot of schools are limited in terms of their resources for English language learners and students are struggling to keep up. So while they're being expected to master academic content, they're, all, they're also trying to learn English as quickly as possible. 72% of ELs are born in the United States. Um, a lot of people think that they have all immigrated to the US, but surprisingly enough, there they haven't. Um, the vast majority, about two thirds, are in grades K through five. And that is because we've seen a, you know, a wave of, of immigration over the last 10, 15 years. And as um, children are born, then they're now beginning to be, to, uh, to attend their um, elementary schools. So, ELs make up a diverse group of students. Across the US, they represent 400 language backgrounds. Again, I should mention that some of these students are not necessarily speakers of languages found outside of the US. They are also speakers of um, languages in American, um, American Native populations, and they are they, the education approaches um, are the same when working with them. So, you know, this brings up a great point. What are our resources in our schools that we are reaching out to our parents um, from the newsletters to just any printed content that we send to parents? 
And, you know, also thinking about our babies, uh, this is a side note, but thinking about they are probably still learning their primary language along with their secondary language. Um, and so what supports do we have in place for that? And how do we support our parents? So yes, I'm very excited because this is a, a topic that is definitely needs to be discussed much more in schools. Yeah, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later um, of specifics for how to engage parents, how exactly we can be supporting native language uh, literacy, especially in the classroom, because not only are our kids, yes, like you're right, um, continuing to learn their, their native language, but we want them to become literate in that native language because the stronger their literacy skills are in their first language, the stronger their literacy skills will be in their second language as we're talking of uh, being English. So with that said, 77% of EL speak Spanish as their primary language at home. Um, it depends on the region in the US. Uh, in Minnesota and some of the more northern states, you'll see languages like Burmese and Somali. Arabic being more prominent. That just depends on um, a lot of a lot of the refugee programs and where families are being placed. Oftentimes people are wanting to be close to their family members, their close friends, and so um, that's where we see those those trends. Over 5 million K-12 students in the U.S. are ELs, and that equates to about 10% of the total U.S. school age population, and it's continuing to increase. These are just stats from uh, 2018. Bilingualism and academic achievement. So um, knowledge and concepts and skills in the first language, like we mentioned, they directly transfer to the second language. So whether that be literacy skills being such an important part, um, but also all the vocabulary that's incorporated to math, science, social studies, they need to be able to understand those concepts clearly and learn the vocabulary in both languages to really master what they mean in English as our second language. So this is especially important when we see students in, you know, entering in ESL, EL, uh, monolingual English schools really at, at higher grades. So third grade on up, that's when they're really starting to get academic content. We see fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they're immersed, right? And so they need a high dose of support to get this vocabulary. They need the vocabulary in their native language, like I said, to master it in English. Unfortunately, because of the lack of resources that schools are aware of, um, we're gonna get into how, how much is available online anymore. And now with this push to uh, be online, we, we are gonna be able to, to focus on accessing those. Um, but students, students don't have, aren't having the opportunity as often as they need to be able to access these resources in their native languages. Things are being broken down um, in ESL programs, and so they're able to make things very visual, right? And they're able to learn that way, but it's hard, again, to really master it. So with that being said, um, it's important to promote bilingualism as it supports in cult cultural diversity, inclusion, um, also, you know, on a whole school level. It's not just within these smaller language focused programs, but being able to promote the idea of, of diversity and the importance of bilingualism on a school level, it also helps, helps our ELs better connect with their peers, um, gain more acceptance from their peers and from the teachers, right? Because the more that they understand, the more interested they are in, they are in who these students are, the more they're going to engage with them. In turn, that also increases the self-esteem for our ELs, um, and all of this lends to higher academic performance. No, um, this is getting me excited, Kelly. I love, I love this, because you're, you're right, and it just 
brings it down to, I guess, me as an educator, I need to do more to bring this out of my students. What can I do to have them share their culture to our small classroom community? And what, how many times am I, have, I, have I gave and have I given my students those experiences to shine with their culture and have parents, you know, bring in, you know, any cultural regalia or anything that we can um, just highlight and you know, celebrate differences. So yes, I'm, I'm kind of just thinking, but I'm, I'm excited. I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, you know, we want to be able to highlight as much as possible the cultures of the students and everything that they're bringing in with, you know, their personal histories, their grandparents' histories and everything, but in a way that doesn't just spotlight them. Right? Because they already feel the pressure going into schools and having people look at them as, oh, they're different. Oh, he speaks this. Oh, he looks this way. She, you know, eats this. So doing it in an inclusive manner where, you know, all of the students are participating and, give, you know, working together on developing projects to share their histories, share their cultures, um, you know, or they're doing them individually. But yeah, needing to incorporate the entire classrooms. Um, so as you can see on this, this chart here, um, this is an example of a variety of English, English language acquisition, essentially, programs. Um, We've got bilingual education and we've got um, ESL, or we can say English language development, it's essentially the same thing. Um, so looking at from first grade all the way through high school, students who are receiving pullout ESL, which in a lot of districts is still really common, and the reason that we default to that is because there's a lack of teachers. And so we think we can go in, pull them as quickly as possible. Similar to special ed students though, they're then being taken away from that classroom, right? It's a lot harder to sit down and plan lessons with classroom teachers and be able to learn how to co-teach in you know, different ways, whether that's one person teaching one lesson and the other person teaching the other lesson, you know, um, whether it's a matter of small groups, it's hard. And with teachers having as much as they do on their plates, sometimes this is something that's like, ah, it's one more thing. Once they do embrace it and they realize, oh, this actually could make my life easier. We actually see more support with the students. That's when we're getting into the content um, English language development programs. And no, so I, I agree. And the better that teachers are open, but it comes from administration. The better teachers are open to pull in, push in, you know, pull outs for our bilingual program, I mean, just the better. Um, so I'm excited. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we see pull out ESL, it's just not effective at all. Um, these kids are going up and then they're going down. Um, and so when teachers are able to really, yes, there's the, there's the um, you know, support of the administration for teachers to co-teach and plan together and really take the content, the academic content that students are learning and modify the activities, modify the content so that our ELs, no matter if they're at level one on WIDA, you know, brand new beginners to level three, upper intermediate, that they're able to understand what's going on. Ideally, this is there's also the native language component that's incorporated in ESL programs though, that's, that's not part of the model. Next, we've got the beginning of our bilingual program. So early exit transitionals, we look at this as being um, a subtractive model. So kindergarten, first grade, kids are starting with Spanish and English, for example, English being the second language, and by third grade, they're out. We can see how they continue to grow a little bit and then with the academic language, they don't, they don't have the support they need. They start to fall a little bit. The late exit transitional, usually we see that at about um, fourth, fifth grade. Again, we see some growth. It starts to dip a little bit in high school, but not as much 
because they've got a stronger foundation. Then we have the two models for dual language programs where bilingual, bilingual education, as you can see, is like an umbrella and we have these different um, models. Dual language is kind of the gold standard. We have one way dual language and we have two way dual language. Um, the difference is, is that two way dual language, as you can see on the chart, it's the best. We've got models that are either 90-10 or 80-20. So in kindergarten, students will start with 90% of the day in Spanish, for example, 10% of the day in English. Um, sometimes that's split up throughout the week. Sometimes that's, you know, only social studies is in English, whatever it is. But really, you want to have a balance throughout the subjects. First grade, they bump down to 80-20. Second grade, 70, 30. By the time they get to 50, 50, theoretically, they are bilingual and biliterate. And then you want to maintain that. And so that's where the academic achievement just flies. One way dual, um, you know, it's also really successful, but when you see kids getting into high school, it starts to dip. Um, one way dual, the difference is, is that, um, you know, the the teacher is is teaching for example we've got one teacher teaching um english we've got one teacher teaching spanish and just as an example the the structure um and the primary language of the students is english they're only learning spanish as that second language whereas the, and that's effective, but it's not quite as effective. You could have those same two teachers in a two-way dual language model, and the difference is being that 50% of the students are native Spanish speakers, 50% are native English speakers. They're learning together. They're learning to play together. They're using both of those languages, and that's where um, we see the, the long-term success. So, with that being said, it takes five to seven years for ELs to develop academic proficiency in English. It's a long time. We start seeing kids after a year or two, they are chattering away about whatever and we think, oh my gosh, they're fluent. Don't need to do any modifications on their, on their homework assignments or anything else anymore. Okay, social proficiency is, is much easier to achieve, but you don't know what's going on underneath. Um, so, Yes, let's continue on. Um, I like that because you're right. Um, we, especially in first grade and kinder, we notice, oh, they're starting to acquire the language and starting to use the language and we're giving them the freedom as teachers. But I, I notice when, you know, sometimes with, you know, when giving out assignments, you know, there's a, a confusion on their face. And sometimes when walking classroom, teachers misconfuse compliance for understanding and um, just well-behaved students as opposed to really getting in to understand the student and you know really work with them uh, or pair them with a, a high a, a student that's willing to talk and communicate with them so yeah I'm on right on board yep yep absolutely um, okay so challenges of serving English learners in schools um, at an administration and uh, instructional coaching level, this is what we see. Understanding connecting with English learners, especially with the language barrier, if they are level one, level two speakers, it's hard. Um, you're busy and you say hi in the hallways, you try to have maybe some short conversations, but it can be intimidating to not have any basis for whatever that student's language is. And so it's like, I don't really want to offend them and throw out a hello and how are you and mispronounce it. So I'm just going to say hi and keep going. Doesn't mean that the person isn't interested, but it's hard, right, to find those avenues to connect. Um, identifying and implementing effective programs, whether those are ESL, bilingual, you know, we have all of those models that we just looked at, but needing to identify the program that fits with your students. Accessing high quality bilingual resources, like I just briefly mentioned, um, there's a lot of stuff online. I think a lot of administrators and instructional coaches think, oh gosh, we need to buy a new curriculum through Pearson or something like that that's thousands and thousands of dollars 
we don't have the budget for that and we're just going to have the ESL teachers, you know, do as much as they can to modify. But ESL teachers are often not giving, given any, maybe a little bit of separate curriculum. Um, similar to the first point, connecting with and engaging parents and families, right? There's a level of being really intimidated. You don't want to, to offend anybody. You don't have enough translators available how do you do it it's gonna it sounds like it's gonna be a mess they don't respond to texts or phone calls but how could they because I'm just using Google Translate and maybe it doesn't even make sense and with that recruiting and training qualified staff so that you can start to make those those connections and build those bridges yeah and so many times we would have a slew of our high school students help come translate. I mean, I think it, it takes us thinking outside of the box on how do we get the, not, the information to our parents. And sometimes they, our parents know they would bring their, you know, affluent uh, daughters or, and so parents are doing their due diligence. And you're right, it's up to us as a school or as teachers to learn something to engage with students. I mean, I was, I had a parent teacher conference that the parent spoke Spanish and I knew just a little bit of what the students taught me. And she was just so grateful that I was willing to try to bridge that gap in community. And she was my, the best parent ever. Like she brought me food, I gained weight. It was kind of crazy, but I just work, working outside of our comfort zone is a challenge, but I encourage you to do it as educators. Yes, absolutely. And that's the thing. Making that, that effort, no matter how small it is, goes so far. And you usually do get a lot of good food or you get, you know, really nice, like the, uh, just during the summer, you know, just really nice text messages or little videos of I got the kids out mowing the lawn and, you know, the lawn mower is so much bigger than them. And it's, you know, they're, They've, they've connected with you, they feel comfortable, and they've accepted you into their community by that point. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, coming over here, best practices for K-12 instructional leaders. So again, promoting bilingualism and academic achievement among English learners in English dominant schools. First on the list previously was getting to know our English learners. So how do we do that? Um, we need to meet with them and meet with their family members if they're new to the school or if you're new to their school. They need to know that you're interested. Um, whether that looks like popping in on student, you know, uh, parent conferences or if it's standing by the door in the morning to say hi. Um, you know, I think that's one of the best things administrators and, and instructional teachers or coaches and, and teachers can do is just you know, they're at their doors, they're welcoming them. Um, encouraging the entire staff of EL teachers, bilingual teachers, bilingual assistants, which that looks different in every school based on the, re the resources and staff they're able to access um, and recruit, but encouraging them to actually interview students and find out, um, and the parents, and find out what their previous ex uh, schooling experiences were if they are um, immigrant students, really no matter where they have come from, in that transition, there's likely been a gap in education. We see a lot of our students coming from Central America um, and, and refugee students who have had a couple of years, number of years, some of them of a gaps in education. And so, you know, we consider them, especially the older ones, as SIF students. Um, and so they are needing to be in the, the instructional approaches that are taken need to address those huge gaps, starting them at, you know, I've, I had a ninth grader a few years ago stop going to school in second grade because she lost her parents and needed to support the family. And she was selling uh, the bus tickets. She's from Honduras. She was selling the bus tickets on, uh, on the, the city buses. Rather than going to school, she didn't have a choice. But she's in ninth grade. She was smart. 
She was sassy, but she was ready to learn. And so it was a matter of bringing her up to speed and she's, she graduated. You know, and you make a great point, meeting people where they are and finding the scaffolds to get them to where they need to be. That's one thing I don't think we do well enough at schools mm -hmm. is provide those services and create those innovative programs individualized for the students so they will be successful. I mean, even something so small as like a mentorship between a student that needs support and another. And so I, I encourage, you're right, we need to do more um, at our schools to uh, support our yeah, absolutely. And typically, you know, going to the next point, we're looking at English proficiency assessments based on federal and state laws. We need to administer um, tests and these look different in each state. But, um, you know, states that have adopted WIDA, which I think there's, I don't know, 30 some, maybe 40 states, um, will administer the WAPT if they are new to the schools, whether they're in kindergarten or they're new to U.S. schools figure out what their level is. They'll take the access test every spring to see where they're at, see where they, um, you know, the, the progress they've made throughout that year. And that's typically the box that gets checked and we say that's enough. But again, we have to know more about our students. This goes to students in general, right? We need to be able to get an idea of who they are as like, uh, for, for a whole child and whole student development, but especially for our, our ELs, um, because they bring so much more to the table than just a proficiency score. Um, with that, and this isn't used nearly as much, it is more common in bilingual programs, but utilizing assessment tools that also measure students' native language skills, their literacy skills, their academic skills, and figuring out where they're at. Because if we have a student that comes in at fifth grade and says, oh yeah, I've been in school since kindergarten, and yeah, my English isn't very good, but you know, I've been in the States for two years. I just didn't have any teachers to help me with English, but I understand everything. Okay, maybe. And then we start seeing grades and then we start realizing, okay, there's some gaps. Well, if we're to uh, um, administer a test like Aprenda or Key Links, we're able to see, do you know how to multiply in Spanish? Do you understand photosynthesis in Spanish? So then we can go back and we can provide that native language instruction to teach those concepts and then teach them in English. Selecting an effective program model. Um, like I said, you know, we need to make sure that the model that is chosen for the school meets the needs of that set uh, school student population. Uh, the first school I taught at in Indianapolis, the, pre the majority of the students who are English learners were um, immigrant students, a mixture of refugee students and students from Central America, which at this point in time really should be considered refugee students as well. Um, the, student that I, or the, the school that I currently teach at, the majority of our students were born in the States. And so as we see with this general, um, you know, number really a uh, percentage of looking at the number of students in the states that have been born in the US, yes, that's the majority, but you've still got these pockets. Um, the first school that I've worked at, it's located in an area where we have all of the refugee housing. There's a really diverse community from a variety of African communities to Central American to South American to Asian, you know, and so that's, that's more comfortable and uh, of an area to be living in. Um, and so, yes, needing to meet your students exactly where they are based on their needs. Um, first thing, you have to address the teacher deficit. You know, teaching in California, it's a different game. You've got way more access to bilingual teachers. Texas, Florida, New Mexico, Arizona, way, way, way more access. And so this isn't really quite an issue. 
um, in some areas that are less diverse. Yeah, but let's look at the, the other states and we know that there's this huge deficit. And so because there are first choice or bilingual teachers, we don't have bilingual teachers, okay, we're gonna go to ESL teachers. I'm technically an ESL teacher, but I'm also a licensed bilingual teacher. If I had the choice, I would be teaching bilingual model. Um, in Chicago, I did, and just being able to see the results as quickly as you are, seeing the kids in K-1 starting to play in both languages, um, I mean, it's amazing. It just, it just really is. So addressing that deficit, with that said, there are so many teachers that are accessible that are certified, they're bilingual, and they're online. Um, you mentioned Bilingual Bridges. That's an amazing, you know, resource that we've developed to put bilingual teachers at the fingertips of schools, of families, and there are many other resources like ours that are out there. They just have to be tapped into. But again, getting that buy-in of realizing that online education full-time I'm not a big fan, but focus, in focused areas, it's absolutely effective. Um, you know, the success that we've seen over the last three years with, uh, with our students is, is tremendous. So being able to just take that jump and try working with teachers online to bring those bilingual resources in that way to the students, it's going to make a world of difference. Um, so to clarify, you, uh, your company, um, with teachers or you work with directly with students? We, um, we employ teachers that are primarily in the U.S. We have a handful that are in Europe. Everybody has their master's degree. Everybody is a certified teacher in K-12 and languages. Um, and so we, as a team, work directly with the students and we work with the schools to, to reach the students. We work with families to reach the students. Yeah. Okay. Professional. That, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay. Professional development. It's important not just for teachers, but for the entire staff. And it's important to understand who your kids are and be able to hone in on their linguistic and cultural backgrounds um, so that everybody is aware and everybody is interested at least to some degree um, and again not making it really general but making it specific to what that student population looks like and with that incorporating that information cultural diversity and inclusion into language and academic curriculum school-wide and so that that material is essentially being interwoven into curriculum so students are getting it too and it's also being reinforced by teachers um, because there are a lot of hidden biases as we know and those those do affect our kids tremendously bilingual resources Literacy. Number one is literacy. You have to provide students with access to bilingual books, to books in their native languages. There are so many resources out there, libraries as well. Indianapolis, we have a lot of access um, to resources like this in print. We also have a lot online, even reading A to Z. That's something that um, at Bilingual Bridges we use all the time because they have books that are wonderful in English, they're all leveled, and in Spanish. So even our kids who are learning Spanish as a second language, if, they're, if we're really wanting to push more of a bilingual approach with them, we're having them work on these books, work on these writing activities and things in English, and then over to Spanish and back and forth that way. Um, it's yeah, really important. These are definitely, and you know, I think the misconception is um, that these are only for students who speak, you know, a different language. No, these are for all of our babies. I mean, we use this in the general ed too. Yeah. Um, 
but just being able to create those scaffolds for students who are not understanding the concept. So yeah, these resources are kind of definitely for everybody. And these scaffolds are can use be used for everybody too, from yep. the images to the pictures to um, you know, trans chocolate to chocolate, you know, on the same vocabulary. What does it look like in Spanish and English? So vocabulary, all these resources are great and they can be translated. So yeah, I just want to See. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's really interesting to be able to see, especially, you know, we see with the with the younger kids, they, the more that they learn about their classmates who are ELs, the more that they want to learn a little bit of their language. And I've had, you know, I remember a kindergartner a few years ago, and she would say, Miss Minks. And she would come up with all of these different words that weren't, you know, for, try to form these sentences that weren't real, but she had that Spanish accent down because she's little and their, their brains are open to acquiring those native like accents. And, but she was like, I just, I just want to do this. And we would go work on uh, Rosetta Stone's Lexia program sometimes. And she'd say, if I'm really good, can I come? And it's like, that's the buy-in you want from the school community, um, from the peers. It's just, it's amazing. Like, it's that kind of stuff that's like, that's why we do what we do, right? Um, yeah, and so these are just, these are just a few resources on here, but um, there's free resources. Reading A to Z, mo you know, so many schools have RAS Kids accounts, Reading A to Z accounts. Um, if, they, if they don't, you're able to get one. I think we pay like $109 for a year for bilingual bridges and we all use it. So totally accessible. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff on Teachers Bay Teachers. We have a lot of really good bilingual teachers out there. There's good free materials. There's good paid materials. There's more and more available for newcomer students too. So all that should definitely be looked into. And then there are a lot of ed tech companies that are popping up and they have new materials programs. Um, Bilingual Bridges, we just launched cloud learning um, in the beginning of June. And basically we put all of our teachers to work over the pandemic, everyone was out of school um, and teaching remotely. And you know, we had Zoom classes once in a while, but we had a lot of time that was that was downtime essentially. So we started developing curriculum um, for English as a second language, Spanish as a second language, reading, writing, and math. It's all K-12. It's all accessible to families, but really pushed for schools. Um, so students are able to, well, we've got a bilingual approach for the academic courses. So we have one course that's Reading for Champions, um, that's in English, really focused on phonics and basic skills. The same course is available in Spanish. We have a Harry Potter course. The kids are learning you know, area and perimeter and building their own Hogwarts dorm. In English, the same course is available in Spanish. Usually it's a different teacher that's teaching it, but the kids are able to transfer that knowledge across and their, their courses that a teacher like you, who's really fun and engaging, put up cool PowerPoints and have these fun activities going and the kids love it. And there's checkpoints with their quizzes, but they can then bounce over to the, the course in another language. No, um, that's great. This is great. I'm just thinking of all the things. So yeah, I'm very excited about Bilingual Bridges and I'm gonna definitely look and um, find more information about it because it's great. Yeah. Parent engagement, cultural events, special celebrations, holidays. There's something that uh, we did at one of my previous schools where when Thanksgiving rolled around, we had a Thanksgiving dinner for all the EL families and everybody brought food from their their cultures and we celebrated together um, also learning about you know American culture and it's things like that that are really really special um, regular communication whether it's text phone in person no matter how in depth or not it is um, and making that effort to communicate in that first language the the, uh, the native language if English isn't accessible. 
So whether you're using translators, whether you're using some, there's new apps that are available that are actually good. Um, if you have to default to Google Translate, just make the effort. Like you said, they're not gonna judge you. They're gonna appreciate that you're trying. And recruiting qualified staff. Like I said, there are a lot of people available online. Um, a lot of teachers that are now unemployed. Snatch them up. Bring them onto your team and, and help, like bring them in to help you develop the program that you need to really meet your English learners' needs. They're amazing resources. Um, you know, in grad school, the amount of information that we learned about bilingual, bicultural education, and the advocacy elements, and, you know, designing programs, like, I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't have traded that for the world, even in undergraduate programs that are similar, focused on bilingual education, like the, the teachers learn so much and so they really need to be um, utilized. No, I agree. Like have, like we need to work harder with getting, and even thinking about administrative, putting resources around this topic and mm -hmm. funding around this and being able to reach out. You're right to colleges, local colleges, and even across the state line to recruit uh, teachers who speak Spanish or just speak different languages or be bilingual and start to um, really take this serious uh, to allocate funding around it. So yeah. Right, right, absolutely. All right, so if anybody has questions, feel free to email me. Um, I can always provide more resources. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I love it. And so like, okay, I think it is bilingualbridges.com, the actual website to where yes. they can go on and find out more information about yep. your program. Yep. So and there's a button there in the header that's big and you can't miss it for cloud learning. Um, so you're able to go in and there's access, you know, there's free access to um, quite a few lessons on each course. So you can just see what it's like and find the teachers that are interesting. And, you know, there's a, there's a free trial. So go in and sign up for the free trial. All right. Thank you. This has been an amazing presentation by Kelly Minx. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.